Good morning. <clears throat> I too want to welcome <clears throat> all of you, especially the visitors, <clears throat> those of you who are here, who are friends and family of Kelly Stoltz. We, our hearts go out in sympathy for you and we mourn with you. Today, we're going to talk about creation, a very, very appropriate day on a Sabbath. We live in a world that is absolutely amazing. This planet, everywhere you look, is full of wonders and questions. The first thing that we notice that our Earth is covered with millions and millions of living organisms. You cannot go anywhere on Earth to find a sterile place, maybe with the exception of a recent volcano. But eventually, it too is going to be covered with material that contains organisms, living organisms. And the variety of living organisms is absolutely stunning. The variation on the theme of life. We see these little young animals, deer, elephant, puppy, chicks. We see frogs, owls, tiger, spiders, <clears throat> monkeys, fish, butterflies. <clears throat> we see plants and trees and flowers fruit and flowers. Oops. There is one thing that's common to all the life forms that we have on this earth, and that is that all life forms are made out of non-living components. If you take living organisms and living cells apart, you end up with substances that you can put in bottles and store them on the shelves indefinitely. And somehow, these non-living substances are put together in such a way in the living organisms that they are alive. So that when we are talking about matter or life, we are really matter contemplating its own existence. It's quite a, quite a phenomenon. But what does it all mean? Where did we all come from? Where do we find answers? In the old days, <clears throat> Christians and Jews alike looked to the Bible for answers. And they found the answers, and found the answers satisfying. But today, we live in a different world. As of late, Seventh-day Adventists find themselves in a small minority that take the, still take the Bible seriously as the authoritative answer to the question of who we are and who made us and who made this world. So we are going to turn to the Bible, even though we are in a minority. Now, to access the Bible, we have to go through a gate. And that gate is Genesis 1.1. You see, the Bible really has three main themes. First, the magnif creation of this magnificent world. Second, the fall, where this magnificent world was corrupted through sin. And these two themes are covered in the early chapters of the Bible, and the rest of the Bible is simply a chronicle of God's efforts to restore mankind to the original, its original place. So we have to go through Genesis 1-1 and accept the fact that there is a God and that he created the world. So we read, in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the word created 
in Hebrew is a word bara. And bara is a word that we don't have an English equivalent. You see, only God can bara, create out of nothing. I once heard a Hebrew scholar, Loma Linda, say that only the Hebrew language has this word describing what God can do, create out of nothing. He, of course, did not know Hungarian. Because it turns out in my native Hungarian language, this is why I have a foreign accent, forgive me for that. In my native language, we also have a word of what God does, and the word is teremt. Not that you have to remember that, but it means exactly the same thing as bara. Only God can teremt, or bara, bring forth from nothing. Now, there's another word in this first verse that sometimes, well, it's interpreted differently. And the word is heavens. We have many dear Christian friends who take the Bible very seriously. And they interpret the word heavens as the universe. And from this, they conclude that the first verse of the Bible describes the creation of not just our world and the solar system, but the entire universe. <clears throat> the Hebrew word that is translated in English as heavens is hashamayim. In the beginning, God brought forth from nothing the hashamayim and the earth. And the hashamayim stands for the visible atmosphere or the skies. So a more literal translation of the first verse of the Bible would read like this. In the beginning, God brought forth from nothing the skies and the earth. This is helpful for Seventh-day Adventists because we believe that the creation of our earth and the solar system happened separately from the creation of the universe. When we read the uh, first chapters of the creation, we are struck by a very unique perspective. It is written by someone who has been, shall we say, an eyewitness to the creation. Well, Moses is the writer of of Genesis, but he lived many, many years after creation. So how is it that Moses could write these intimate terms and these details about our creation. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is blessed by the work of a lady who has received special revelations through visions and through dreams. Her name is Mrs. Ellen G. White. And she was shown scenes from the Bible, and she has given us some additional details. In a book, Patriarchs and Prophet, on page 83, she writes, Adam, the first man, Adam, had learned from the Creator the history of the creation. When we read, okay, so Adam, of course, lived many, many years. He spoke to his great, 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 great grandchildren down to seven generations. And he told the story that he heard from God. After the flood, the same story was passed on from parent to child to the lineage of Abraham. And this is how Moses was able to write down the story that Adam heard from God himself. So I think it is helpful that when we read the Genesis 1 and 2, we are, re- we are as if we would be listening to the Lord telling our origins. There are actually two in the beginnings in the Bible. The first one is the one we have just spoken of, Genesis 1.1. But there is a second in the beginning, John 1.1. Genesis 1.1, according to our understanding, is describing the creation of our earth and the solar system. John 1.1, on the other hand, 
occurred before the creation of the entire universe, when only the Trinity was in existence. And so this could have been much, much earlier than the creation of our Earth. And since we know that the, um, at the moment, astronomers tell us that the size of the universe is something like 13 billion light years, it is not far-fetched to suggest that perhaps the creation of the universe was as long ago as 13 billion years ago. <clears throat> Let's first talk about our creation, the creation of our planet and the solar system. When did the creation occur? Does the Bible have any information on this? The answer is yes. The key verse is 1 Kings 6.1. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel, Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel that he began to build the house of the Lord. We know that Solomon started his reign in 1000 BC. So from this um, starting point, <clears throat> 965 years before Christ, we know that the Exodus occurred 480 years before, 1445 BC, and from these three verses, three uh, places in the Bible, um, Genesis, and um, let me see, I can't read it very well. <clears throat> Genesis, Exodus, and Galatians, um, <clears throat> Abraham entered <clears throat> Canaan 430 years before the Exodus in 1875 BC. And he was 75 years old, according to Genesis 12:4. So Abraham was born 1950 years before Christ BC. The flood came 290 years before Abraham was born, according to Genesis 11. And <clears throat> creation was 1656 years before the flood, according to the genealogies in Genesis 5. So putting it all together, we have now the year 2013, and we have 3,896 BC. You, we add these two numbers together, we subtract one because there is no year zero, and we come up with the number 5,908 as the age of our Earth according to the Bible. Now, this interpretation depends on using the King James genealogies and so on. But it's a nice point, and when we say the Earth is approximately 6,000 years old, we are simply saying what the Bible is saying. The second in the beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Isaiah 44.6, we find out that there was no one preceding God. Isaiah 44.6, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Nothing and no one preceded God, according to the Bible. When Jesus prayed in John 17, he says, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. This simply reaffirms that Jesus along with God the Father, pre-existed our earth. But the writer of Psalm 90, who was Moses, tells us that God has existed from eternity. He says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So, 
let's then summarize what we are saying about the creation. In the very beginning, before the universe, there was only the Trinity in existence. There was no universe, there was no time. So the question, who created God, is senseless. There was no one else but God. And when did God start creating? We, there was no time. So that question also does not make sense. Time only began when the Lord, the Trinity, decided to create the universe. <clears throat> the Trinity created time, space, and eventually billions, we, we think, many, many worlds populated with created beings. Angels also were created. <clears throat> Somewhere along the line, there was war in heaven, and Lucifer and one-third of the angels were exiled from heaven. And finally, after all this, the creation of the solar system, including our Earth. And we read in the Bible, and I am very pleased for this, Job 38, 7, sons of God shouted for joy. We were welcomed into the universe. If you read contemporary literature now from secular scientists, they are really concerned about aliens out in space coming and getting us and uh, killing us and whatever. Popular science and popular thinking portrays the universe as a hostile place full of dangers and aliens, but definitely a projection of what a human nature is into outer space. And of course, the science fiction movies in Hollywood are all the time. The alien is always the bad guy. And here we read in the Bible that sons of God shouted with joy when we appeared. And the reality is that the universe is a friendly place. And one of these days, we are going to be able to communicate with other beings in the universe. And we'll find out for ourselves. So what we are saying here is that when the Earth and the solar system came into existence, there existed all these galaxies, billions of galaxies with billions of stars and unnumbered worlds. And so we are latecomers to the universe. But, and I just wanted to show you our place here in the Milky Way, this is our galaxy, a Milky Way galaxy containing unnumbered stars. Uh, the light, if you want to travel from one end of the galaxy to the um, I'm sorry, Milky Way galaxy at, with the speed of light, might as well go the fastest available transportation, it will take you 100,000 years to go at the speed of light from here to here. Our sun and the solar system is located here. And if you want to travel across our solar system with the speed of light, how long do you think it'll take? It'll take nine hours with the speed of light. So nine hours versus 100,000 years. They have made a model, or they've suggested that you could make a model of the Milky Way galaxy um, a spiral like this that has a diameter of 80 kilometers. And then, according to scale, the solar system would be two millimeters versus 80 kilometers. This is our place in the universe. <clears throat> but the bigger question is, okay, so we are not that significant. Why did the Lord create us? <clears throat> was he simply can't stop creating? We have a wonderful answer in the Bible that is absolutely amazing. You remember, God says, let us make men and women to our image. In Patriarchs and Prophets, Mrs. White writes, man was to bear God's image, 
both in outward resemblance and in character. And adding to that, all heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. There are no other humans out there except those who have been resurrected. And Jesus was resurrected. And so, of course, I do not know what was the purpose of God's, what God had in mind creating humans. But he did have a purpose for us. And I am just speculating here, and it's not going to be on a test, that uh, maybe we were to represent God because we resemble God. We were to represent God before the other in the created universe, before the numerous worlds. <clears throat> we'll find out in more detail in due time <clears throat> why we have been created. <clears throat> now, I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about what the Earth looked like when it was created. See, I was thinking in the past that, of course, the Lord made the Garden of Eden, which was beautiful, but my thought was that outside the Garden of Eden, everything was barren, kind of like my backyard. <clears throat> but I was wrong. As the Earth, Mrs. White says that the world outside the Garden of Eden was almost as beautiful as in the Garden of Eden. As the earth came forth from the hand of its maker, it was exceedingly beautiful. Its surface was diversified with mountains, hills, and plains, interspersed with noble rivers and lovely lakes. But the hills and mountains were not abrupt and rugged, abound with terrific steeps and frightful chasms as they now do. The sharp and rug rugged edges of Earth's rocky framework were bur buried beneath the fruitful soil, which everywhere, everywhere produced a luxurious growth of verdure. There were no loathsome swamps or barren deserts. Graceful shrubs and delicate flowers greeted the eye at every turn. The entire landscape outweed or white in beauty the decorated grounds of the proudest palace. The Garden of Eden, and by the way, the Garden of Eden means the Garden of Delight, uh, was to be a model imitated by the subsequent generation on an unfallen world. So the earth was to be populated with gardens that looked like copies of the Garden of Eden instead of cities, much of the habitable portion of earth, and there was much more dry land than it's now, <clears throat> was to be covered by gardens where nature could continually speak to humanity of the creator's wisdom and love. Now, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve studied the laws and the operations of nature on every leaf of forest, of the forest or stone of the mountains, in every shining star, in the earth, air, and sky. God's name was written. The order and harmony of creation spoke to them of infinite wisdom and power. And what was so interesting in this description in Patriarchs and Prophet that Adam and Eve would be con constantly gaining new treasures of knowledge, discovering fresh springs of happiness, and obtaining clearer and yet clearer conception of the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. This was before the fall, so the plan of salvation was not revealed. Yet, Adam and Eve already were in possession of proofs of the immeasurable, unfailing love of God by simply studying nature of the riches that the Lord has provided for them. And as we look at nature today, we find that the way God made our earth, all the organisms, the millions of them, they fit into an ecosystem, an ecological system where every organism supports another organism. So, 
humans and animals are supported by plants. I think this is washed out. The arrows are washed out, unfortunately. And plants are supported by microorganisms as they convert nitrogen of the air into nitrate and ammonia. The bottom line is that no organism, essentially no organism, can survive by itself. In order for organisms to live, you need the entire ecosystem. And so it stands to reason that the biblical description of the Lord creating everything all at once is supported by observation and science, as opposed to postulating that individual organisms sprung up and survived all by themselves, according to another theory that name you will not mention. <clears throat> In the Garden of Eden and before the flood, if Adam and Eve or the antediluvians looked up into the sky <clears throat> and they were blinded by the sun, that would have constituted a design fault. <clears throat> the Bible says that the atmosphere was different before the flood. It contained a water canopy and this water canopy in the upper atmosphere dispersed the sunlight so that there were no shadows in the Garden of Eden or in the antediluvian world. Um, just as you see in today, this is a poor illustration, but that's the best I could find, is these lenses are dispersing the light above, and so there are no shadows here because Imagine that this would be the water canopy dispersing the light evenly. This is also the explanation why there were no rainbows before the, in a pre-flood world. <clears throat> At the end of the creation story, we read, and then God saw everything that he had made, and it, indeed it was very good. If this earth was simply a copy of other worlds that the Lord has made, maybe billions of them, he would not need to do a quality control. It would be so routine. The very fact that the Lord stopped and examined everything carefully that he had made suggests to me that we are unique, that it required a final inspection. <clears throat> As creationists, we recognize that the, our planet and everything on, his, on it is God's property. And whatever we possess, however hard we work for it, is ours only on loan. And we are responsible to the Lord how we deal with it. We also believe as creationists that we have a common parent. We are all descendant of Adam and Eve to the lineage of Noah. Now the consequence of this is that every human being is a blood relative. It may be everybody in this room, we are related by blood. Maybe cousins many, many times removed. And the person who cuts us off on a highway, we should cut him a little slack. It's, only a, it's a blood relative. We, we have to look upon every human being as our blood relative, and we treat blood relatives a little differently than everybody else. There is no everybody, anybody else, right? But you see, believing in creation has consequences, and this is a very, very helpful way of looking at other human beings. They are really relatives, many times removed. Now, Life is a very, very, it's easy to be alive, when, especially when you're young. I'm looking around, little ones. It comes so naturally to be alive. And of course, we tend to forget, or we never knew, that living is a very, underlying living is an extremely complex phenomenon. And I just want to show you the wiring, part of the wiring diagram that is represents what's happening as we are sitting here and <laughs> worshiping. There are all kinds of chemical reactions that are occurring inside of us continually. 
And as long as these chemical reactions continue, we are in good shape. When they come to a stop, then watch out. And we are in trouble. Now, we recognize that there are many people who do not accept our view of creation. And they are thinking, scientists especially, they can figure out where we have come from, other than considering the Bible. So we have been probing other planets and moons in a solar system for signs of life. There are 150 planets and moons in our solar system. And now we can say with absolute certainty that there is not a trace of life anywhere except here on Earth. So the question comes, where did life come from? From a, per from a perspective of a person who does not accept the biblical version. <clears throat> Before the 17th century, this was not a problem because everybody knew that life occurred, came about spontaneously. I give you the formula how to generate mice. You take a dirty shirt, you add wheat to it, put it in a jar, and wait 21 days. And sure enough, mice comes out of the jar. That was commonly accepted. <clears throat> we smile at this, but this was the experience. <clears throat> there were scientists by the name of Reddy, Spallanzani, and Louis Pasteur, whose work conclusively demonstrated that spontaneous generation of living matter is a, is, does not happen. We do not generate living organisms from non-living organisms. So it is recognized the term is abiogenesis. This does not happen any longer in our Earth. Well, OK, what about life being imported from another star system? Astronomers tell us that the closest star to our, Earth, our sun, which is a star, is four and a half light years away, the Alpha Centauri A and B star system. That amounts to 28.5 trillion miles. <clears throat> Even the most optimistic person would, would not expect an organism traveling that distance. So for all practical purposes, panspermia, the importation of living organisms from outer space, is an impossibility. <clears throat> OK. So where are the poor unbeliever to go? <clears throat> Life cannot generate spontaneously here. We cannot import life from outer space. What they have done is they recalibrated the history of our Earth. In the early 20th century, a scientist, a Russian scientist by the name of Operin, postulated that what it's true that we cannot have life generating spontaneously now. But what if conditions on a primitive Earth were different? So he, he came up with a scheme postulating that maybe organic substances were produced in the atmosphere on an, of an early Earth. And these organic substances were washed down, collected in an ocean, and pretty soon out of a primordial soup, organisms were formed spontaneously. This approximates the current model of chemical evolution. This idea got a tremendous boost by a graduate student by the name of Stan Miller in the University of Chicago in 1953. Stanley, Dr. Miller, built a closed system of a, a glass made up of glass tubes and, and the spherical uh, chambers where he introduced methane, ammonia, and water and circulated them here. And he introduced electrodes where these gases were sparked by electricity. And after about a, a week of this, 
He collect, he col he, of course, he collected whatever stayed in water. And when he examined the contents of, of this trap, he found to his delight that organic substances were produced. And these experiments were repeated by others, variations, and they were able to produce amino acids and even and other relevant organic substances as well as components of nucleic acids. In the 1960s and 70s, it was the golden age of chemical evolution because people were just projecting ahead. You see, if you produce amino acids, you still have to put them together into proteins. And if you produce these components of nucleo, nucleobases, you still have to form nucleotides and nucleic acids. These are large molecules. And then when you have those, you still have to put them together into a living cell. Of course, they were not able to do that, but they were optimistic and they were projecting forward that they were just a few years away from solving how life might have come to this earth. Well, 60 years has passed and they got stuck. Uh, there has been no demonstrable progress made in the area of chemical evolution. <clears throat> but what these efforts have demonstrated how difficult it is. It showed the insurmountable nature of the problem. And since then, since the 1950s, we have learned more about life. And now we understand that life cannot start spontaneously anywhere in the universe, anywhere, at any time. So we are at the point now, from biology, we can show that the very existence of life is a convincing evidence for the existence of a creator. A creator is the only explanation for the very existence of this abundant life on our Earth. Well, Harvard University, this is absolutely the leading university in this country, it was founded in the 1600s, and they, are, they have the most illustrious scientists we know, and they were getting impatient about the lack of progress. So in 2005, they decided to enter into this field and they launch, launched an ambitious project designed to ascertain how life began on Earth. Known as the Origins of Life in the Universe initiative, the university has promised researchers several years of seed money, $1 million per year. And so one young professor who was of chemistry and chemical biology at Harvard, who was a recipient of this grant, made the following statement. <clears throat> My expectation is that we will be able to reduce this, the origin of life problem, to a very simple series of logical events that could have taken place with no divine intervention. This statement is absolutely the height of arrogance and and mis being misinformed and uninformed. But anyway, since he's a professor at Harvard, we can, we have to live with that. I checked the internet to see his publications. As of 2013, he has not published his very simple s series of logical events, not even close. <clears throat> what is ironic is, that Harvard University in 1636, Pop, Popman, close to when he was established, published the following rules. And these rules would be such that it would be welcomed in any current Adventist university. Let me read this to you. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, John 17, 3. And therefore, to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, 
let everyone seriously set himself by prayer and in secret to seek it of him. Proverbs 2, 3. Everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day that he shall be ready to give such an account of his proficiency therein. Harvard University, 1636. The founders of Harvard would be horrified to see the millions of dollars spent trying to figure out how life came into existence when they have the answer right in front of them in the Bible. There's only one correct answer possible to the question, where did life come from? It is given not by review articles in scientific journals, nor by textbooks of biology. It is given by the creator himself, etched in stone by his fingers, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony, the tables of stone inscribed by the finger of God. <clears throat> 